Welcome to Practical Open Source Engineering, International Standardization, and the M17 Protocol. My name is Michelle Thompson, and I'm your host for today. Thank you for being here. Practical Open Source Engineering is a series of talks from the San Diego chapter of Information Theory Society of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE for short. IEEE is the world's largest professional engineering society. Open Research Institute is a nonprofit dedicated to open source research and development of digital radio in all aspects. ORI is the co-sponsor of the Practical Open Source Engineering Series and is the fiscal sponsor of the M17 project. To learn more about ORI's work, please visit openresearch.institute on the web. M17 project development is the subject of today's talk. To find out more, about M17, please visit m17project.org. Technologies do not grow and mature in isolation. To maximize utilization, organizations often turn to ecosystems of partners to drive collaboration and integration of these technologies. One structured and proven way of establishing such an ecosystem is via standardization. Standards provide vehicles to establish best practices and define interfaces for compliance, allowing users to have confidence that the products they employ are safe, reliable, and are of good quality. M17 Project has developed a new digital radio protocol for data and voice made by and for amateur radio operators. The protocol's voice mode uses the free and open Codec 2 voice encoder. This means there are no patents, no royalties, and no licensing or legal barriers to scratch building your own radio or modifying one you already own. This freedom to build, understand, and innovate is core to amateur radio, but has been missing from the commercially available digital voice modes. This is part of why amateur radio digital voice modes have largely stagnated since the 1990s and were almost wholly dependent on commercial products that aren't well designed for amateur radio users. The protocol specification that we're talking about today can be found at spec.m17project.org. Our speaker, Aaron Bruneval, is a distinguished engineer from the office of the corporate CTO at Dell Technologies. She is an experienced technologist with a demonstrated history of working in the information technology industry, skilled in system architecture, virtualization, storage, the Internet of Things, digital twin, and national and international standards development. Erin illuminates the process of international standardization for a promising open source communications protocol called M17. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you very much for the warm welcome. Very glad to be here. So my name is Erin Bornebaugh. I'm going to talk today about international standards and their relationship to the M17 project. Today we're going to cover a discussion about what are standards and why you would want to use them. We're going to talk a little bit about who develops them because obviously they don't appear magically out of thin air. And we're going to talk about the relationship to M17, why M17, why M17 should care, and um, assuming that you do care, how could M17 take advantage of this opportunity? So who am I? My name is Aaron Bornebell, Kilo One, Echo November Bravo. I'm just, today I'm here speaking by, um, on behalf of myself. I'm not speaking on behalf of Dell. If you want me speaking on behalf of Dell, this is a different conversation. <laughs> Um, as Mich um, Michelle mentioned, I spend a lot of time in standards development organizations. I chair a number of groups um, on system architecture, the Internet of Things, digital twin, and, and um, other aspects. This is what I do with my time. So let's get started. I'm going to talk to start with a little bit about variability. And the reason for this is because it turns out there's no standardization for standards. There's all kinds of different standards, and nobody agrees on one true definitions for what standards are, for what some of the, the terminology that we use is. It varies from organization to organization. Um, I'm going to be using some 
language and some terminology in this presentation um, that uh, is modeled after mostly for the most part what ISO and IEC do. Um, and this is going to probably differ in some respects from what um, some of your experiences may have been. And you're going to say, wait a minute, that's not quite our experiences. So um, unfortunately, we're both right. And um, I'm, I'm having to draw a line in the sand just so that we can have this conversation. Um, but, but acknowledging that your experiences and your thoughts are also correct, but in a different context. And we could talk about the, those contexts if they're useful. Somebody can't hear audio. Hmm. Michelle, are we okay with audio? I can hear you. Okay. Very good, thank you. So let's start with a definition of what a standard is. Um, this is from ISO.org, and it's surprisingly one of the few that I could, I could find, um, where we say that a standard is a document, or it's a series of documents, that we establish by consensus. Consensus is um, an agreement amongst multiple people. Um, we might call it lack of sustained opposition. What does that mean exactly? It varies from committee to, com to committee. Sometimes it means that nobody is disagreeing with what you're saying and raising their hand and saying, so sorry, sorry, stop. I completely disagree with what you're saying. In other circles, it's possible for maybe one person or two people to disagree, but everybody else agrees. Um, so we can vary on our definition of consensus a little bit. The people that are involved in authoring the standard are subject matter experts. We want people who understand the, to uh, the subject of interest, the topic, whatever you're defining. Um, we also want standards to be approved by a national uh, by a recognized body um, that provides some sort of guidance to people developing the standards. Yes, it is possible if somebody authors a document and calls it a standard on their own, it doesn't carry quite the same weight as if a national or international organization puts their stamp on it and says, yes, we have followed all of the processes that maximize the quality of this document, um, and therefore we believe that this is appropriate for standardization. So, Technically, it doesn't need that backing from the recognized body, but it does increase the quality quite a bit, and it's worthwhile. You'll probably find other definitions of a standard. Um, I didn't look very hard, but th this one resonates really well with me, and so I put it on the slides. Um, and it may differ slightly or dramatically from this definition. Standards are written in a language that I like to, um, several of us like to call standardese. It's sort of English, but it's sort of not English. <clears throat> Um, and we can talk a little bit about some of those differences a little bit later in this presentation. So what do we want to use a standard? What's the purpose of it? We're looking to help increase um, the use of a technology. We might want to increase interoperability. We want to define interfaces that people use, and we want some, some notion of weight to those interfaces so that people know that these are, this is the, the interface that we're going to use, and everybody else is going to use it too. And I feel comfortable knowing that we're all using the same interface. Standards could also be guidance. It doesn't have to be an interface. And again, it's guidance that everybody agrees on. And there's consensus in the room that this is the right way, the, the right way to do it. Best practices would be a great example. Um, and why else would you want to use a standard? You're looking to benefit from that weight of the standard, from, from the fact that you know that other people are following you um, in the use of a particular version of a standard so that everybody will line up their ducks in a row together. So what kind, of, what kind of standards do we have? Here's just a few characteristics. Some standards are developed nationally. For example, we have some in the United States. There's some in Germany. That pretty much every country in the world has their own national body who develops standards. We also have international organizations like ISO that I talked about a few minutes ago, or IEEE, who is hosting this session. We have I was a little hesitant to use the word, the term full standard, but it, it, it's probably good enough. This, is, um, this would be a very large document. We have technical standards, which might be a little bit smaller. Some people use the term technical report. Um, that might be closer to white paper, a little bit smaller. Um, it can be as large or as small as you want it to be, as long as it conveys the thoughts um, that you want it to. And standards can be free, or they could be offered a nominal charge, and that charge is usually for 
Um, it goes back to the development body who, um, who helped host the development of the standard to pay for things like um, management staff and um, program, uh, program management and internet and all the things that they have to pay for. It does not go back to the people that authored the, the standards generally, as far, at least as far as I'm aware, which is kind of interesting. I talked a little about standardies, and one aspect of standardies is this notion of normative requirements. When we talk about normative requirements, we're talking about placing a requirement on the reader of the document to make them do something. You don't want them just to read the document and look and say, that's nice, and put it down and go to something else. We want them to react to it. So this is how we enforce compliance, to make sure that um, users are either in compliance with a standard or they're not within compliance. And there's three different kinds of um, normative requirements, and actually I should, I should probably use a different term for this, but normative um, the type, two, of the, two of the types of normative requirements, one I call normative requirements, and the other I would call normative inclusion. Normative inclusion would be if I have another document that I want to insert in line in, inside of an existing document. So I have a vocabulary standard that I want to pull into um, my document on a protocol. I can do a normative inclusion and just put one line of text in my standard and say, pull in that vocabulary standard and pull the whole thing in. Here, by, by normative requirement, I mean that we use language such as shall, should, may, and can for the magic words, which force the reader to do something, or at least this helps them um, understand what they have to do in order to be compliant with your standard. And notice the one that trips everybody up is the difference between may and can. May means that you're granting somebody permission to do something, but you're not saying much about um, whether they should choose to do it or not. Can is the ability to do something. Um, it's a question of, mother, may I go to the store or can I go to the store? Do I have a car? Yes, I can go to the store. So it's a little bit different and it's one that trips people up a lot um, and it's very interesting. So the example that I use, the client shall connect to the server by UDP on 1700, um, probably resonates with this group, I, I suspect. If people are not using UDP on port 1700, they are not in compliance with this standard, flat out. And you don't, um, and, uh, I would generally take the position that if you're not complying with the standard, you need to fix that problem, otherwise we can't help you, if that makes sense. By the way, Michelle, I can stop for questions or should I just continue? No, go ahead no, and continue ahead. and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Okay, okay. So, um, there's at least a couple of different types of organizations. I talked about standards development organizations. Um, there's also a different type of organization called either an industry association or a consortium. And these groups, again, I'm drawing a line in the sand, technically don't develop standards, they develop guidance because they're not a standards development organization. I wanna focus our, our this talk on standard development organizations because we, want, we, we don't wanna just develop guidance, we wanna develop a standard. Um, and so some, there are some consortia who say, we develop standards. Okay, well, in my opinion, your, your standards development organization in that, pace, in that place. So um, again, due to the, the loose vocabulary that we have for what actually is a standards development organization, what isn't, we don't necessarily agree on this. Um, so let's focus our attention on standards development organizations and less on consortia. So who exactly are standards development organizations? There's several, several on the top here. Um, you probably know most of these, or at least have heard of them at some point. A lot of these are international, although we have ANSI, which is in the United States, and we have DIN, which is in Germany. Um, we also have a number of consortia, which uh, again, tend to author guidance and technically probably don't, don't author standards. Um, try, trying to make this very clear so that we focus on the right groups. So why, does M7, why should M17 care? I talked about these three um, categories of reasons to care. The first one would be defining a standard for interoperability. If you have vendors who would want to implement the M17 protocol, you'd like a defined interface in a standard that carries some weight to make sure that um, manufacturers know that they're using the right version of the interface and that other manufacturers will also use that interface. 
You may want to develop some guidance to, tell, to um, instruct people on how to use the protocol uh, or how to use other aspects of the systems that are, de that are developed. And again, M17 will probably want to benefit from the weight of a standard. So how can you do this? How can you take something like um, a, a protocol that somebody's developed and make it a standard? We start with the choice of a standards development organization. I have listed two here that I'm familiar with the paths on how you could do this. Um, there's probably a comparable one in IEEE, although I'm not familiar with it. I probably should have listed it as a, as a to-do. The first one, which hopefully everybody knows, is IETF. These standards are offered free of charge, and this is a very grassroots organization. Everything is done at a, I don't want to say low level, but um, I, I guess grassroots is the right phrase. Um, they do have a, uh, a bit of a network flavor, so this actually suits M17 very well. ISO has a process called PASS, or Publicly Available Specifications, where you can take an existing document and run it through the ISO processes and publish it as a standard. I believe, I need to check this, I believe that these are offered free charge as long as, as long as the existing material is offered. In other words, you still offer the protocol on the M17 project website. It's just that now it's available as a standard from ISO. I can verify this, but I'm pretty sure this is true. You know, I'll verify it for you. Um, again, these are just two choices. Every uh, other organizations could certainly offer their own um, avenues for standardization of a project like M17. The difference here is that um, you guys have already done most of the work for developing the protocol. And so it's closer to a rubber stamp, less than um, holding a number of meetings over several years and hammering out the details, you've done most of the work. And so this is a little bit different than the way standards are traditionally done, um, where we start, from, we start from an idea and actually gather people from around the world to develop a full standard based off of that idea. Just a couple of quotes from the IETF. I love this just kind of reflect, uh, shows a little bit about how grassroots they are. Um, the first quote from David Clark, we reject King's president and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. I like that. <laughs> and another, another quote from John Postel. I hope I'm saying that right, Postel. Be conservative in what you send and liberal in what you accept. So there's a number of ideologies at the IETF which help characterize the, the nature and the way they operate. Something that you wanted, that you thought this was a good idea, uh, you could choose an organization and start a discussion with them about how you might achieve this. You would identify the deliverables that you want to, uh, to standardize. It could be a protocol spec, it could be a guidance spec, whatever you've got in the M17 project that you'd want to do. Um, again, connect to the organization, find out the right committee that would be responsible for helping you make this happen. You would want to educate the people in this group so that they understand what changes need to be applied to your existing documents. What you have probably is not a standard, although it might be close, and it might just be a little bit of finessing of the language just to make sure that it is expressed appropriately as a standard. And then you figure out a release schedule. How often do you want to release updates, new additions to your standard? Do you want to do it every year? Is it after um, major functional releases? That's up to you. You get to decide that. So what did we talk about? We talked about what standards are. 